as Bobby Moore lifted the World Cup at Wembley, the summer of 1966 became the stuff of legend. We were on top of the world. The euphoria still hasn't worn off 50 years later. In that moment, Britain went from grainy black and white to glorious technicolour. And across the country, people's lives were doing the same. We love talking about many, many subjects, but here's something. 1966. It was such an exciting time. What were you doing? Revolutionary times without a doubt. If I wanted to have sex with someone, I just had sex with someone. I didn't really bother to get clearance from anyone. Um... <laughs> Did you take drugs? Did you do blueies? What you call keep awake pills drugs today? Do you remember the World Cup? Men in short shorts. Oh, happy days. That's me there. Uh, I used to score with a lot of girls. <laughs> It was a golden moment for Britain, the peak of the 60s wave. But what was life really like at the time? The big problem in those days for me was my sexuality, because it was illegal. So you live a lie. 66, I was living a lie. We were caught between the old world and the new. I honestly never felt at any time during 1966 secure. And one was just sort of hoping, digging in, until something good came along. It's interesting, isn't it? 1966. Give us a ring. <laughs> we all remember the World Cup final. But what about the other 364 days of the year? The real revolution of 66 was happening far away from the football pitch in the lives of a new generation who would shape modern Britain. As the bell struck 12 and 1966 began, 23-year-old Chris and 18-year-old Linda were seeing in the new year in central London. They had no idea what was just around the corner. To celebrate New Year's Eve, I went with some friends to the Blind Beggar pub. A few of the lads that we, we'd met um, took us back to the train. We happened to be talking about where we were going, and I said, oh, I'm going to Barking. And they both said, no, you're not. The train's going the wrong way. And I went, oh, no. Chris said to me, I'll take you home if you like. I was shy, to be honest, very shy. It was meeting Linda that brought me out of myself. So for me to have picked up Linda the way I did was totally out of character. Mm. So something must have happened, mustn't it? Chris wasn't the only one who was feeling more confident. The grey post-war days of the 1950s were being swept away by a new generation determined to live a very different kind of life. 21 years on from the end of the war, modern Britain was coming of age. I was aware that things were changing, usually through music. Everything was different from the way Ma and Paul and Uncle John and Uncle Bill done it. It was a freedom in the 60s because we had nobody to follow. There was no the generation before. The older ones would stay at home, I should imagine, but the youngsters thought it belonged to them. You know, if you wanted to do it, you did it. If, if you wanted to wear whatever you wore, you wore it. So. They were there to enjoy, you know, so I did. We did. Yeah, we did. <laughs> In 1966, over 40% of the population were under 25, including every member of the Beatles and the Stones. In just a few short years, British pop music had conquered the globe and inspired a huge shift in attitudes at home. Time magazine declared the capital to be swinging, and it certainly seemed to be true. London in 1966 is the equivalent of Florence during the Renaissance or something. It's like the peak, the place to be, and I was there. Much of London was still bomb damaged and swathed in smog, but in the very centre was a splash of colour. Soho. 
Fashionable Carnaby Street was the destination by day, but after dark, there was only one place to be seen for the true music fan, a rough and ready basement club called the Flamingo. Well, the thing about the Flamingo was it was really packed and sweaty. It was really hot atmosphere. There was a bit of our edge to the Flamingo, a bit of a dodgy gangster vibe about it. It was fabulous. Run by Johnny Gunnell and his brother Rick, the Flamingo often stayed open until dawn. In 66, Eddie Tantan was playing trumpet for Georgie Fame's house band, the Blue Flames. Though sometimes it was more than just music keeping the party jumping. The raids, the raids, oh, the, raids. The, red, the red light would come on in there and everybody would throw it on the floor. <laughs> I got jailed that one of those nights. <laughs> he arrested me, took yeah. me to West End Central. Yeah. They searched me. I had 600 pounds on me. Yeah, 600 yeah. pounds. Yeah. Huh? Purple heart deal. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. The whole of London now. Where else could you find a club like the Flamingo? No, no, no. Nowhere. No. There wasn't even one no, that no, was no. close. For the 23-year-old G.I. Gino Washington, the Flamingo was like a second home. It's got a great vibration in there. What you need, an American away from home. It's just so right, this music. The Flamingo was soon to give Gino his big break. I went and asked Georgie, could, could I sing a song with your band? And you? He said, uh, can you sing? I say, sing? Well, my sister is in Martha and the Vandellas, and uh, my auntie is Donna Washington. Of course, I'm lying. You know, I'm lying my tail off. They started up, and I hit that singing, man, and the house was rocking, man. You know, I was very popular with the ladies, you know. Yes, 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 I didn't have to beg no more. <laughs> On the edge of Soho, 19-year-old Janet was in her first year of architectural school, one of only a handful of girls in her year. Now I go see Georgie Fame. That's right, in my diary, that's rated as just about as important as everything else. Go to see Georgie Fame, the Flamingo, 9th of July. 11th of July, start work Wembley, four weeks, yuck. By the summer of 1966, the college said, we have to have work experience. We had to work in a real architect's office. I thought, oh my God, it's real people. Anyway, my father, he pulled a load of strings to get me a job as a temporary architectural assistant. And he said, for Christ's sake, whatever you do, don't embarrass me. And yet I went, turned up at their offices in Wembley High Road, in a very, very short mini skirt with the silver hair. And they asked me if I was the new secretary. I went, no, I'm the new architect. <laughs> I just looked ill. To add to everything, it was the World Cup. England were at Wembley. You couldn't get in or out or anywhere near the building. It was like World Cup fever, including with my dad. And all I was doing was sitting in an office trying to draw a bloody sports centre. <laughs> I've actually found two of my pay slips. JV Ball, 23rd of July. This is 1966. So I'm a temporary architectural assistant. Blah, 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 tax. Net, £10.16. pence. No wonder I made all my own clothes. The average weekly wage for a woman in 1966 was 12 pounds, while men were earning 23. Despite this inequality, wages had been on the rise and much of the 60s optimism came from having a bit more money in our pockets. 66 was the peak of British industry. Our factories were producing more than they ever had before, and they ever would again. In the Midlands, Sandy was 21 years old and working at the Botterill Boot Factory. 
We were making all sports footwear, really. I can remember working on running shoes mainly and football boots. Ordinarily, making football boots wasn't anything to shout about, but the impending World Cup had the factory buzzing with excitement. I think we lived in hope, because you do, don't you? Um, oh, wouldn't it be lovely if they did win, especially, you know, um, being in England as well. But Sandy was about to play a bigger role in the World Cup than anyone could have imagined. Somebody along the line said, oh, we're going to do the World Cup football boots, better not mess them up. <laughs> I went home and told my dad and he was over the moon because he was a sports fanatic. I said, oh, that's really, really good. And I'm with it. He said, yes, it's really good, you know. And I think he made some kind of remark, well, if you're helping making them, girl, they're bound to win. The boots were being made for the German brand Puma and once finished, they were shipped off ready for the England team's first match. It was magical, I think. I was young and it was just really nice to be part of something that was so important at that time to our country, you know, because we'd have the really dark days when I was a child of just after the war. And then you've got this really nice golden era. You were a lot more free than you had been in the past, I think. And it was just nice to be able to be part of something that was national. Young women were feeling these new freedoms most keenly. Though many still married young, new opportunities were starting to open up. Even outside of the big cities, things were changing. In Cornwall, 20-year-old secretary Gwyn Haslock had taken up the new sport of surfing. This is the first beach that I served in a competition in 1966. I had to enter with the men because there was no lady competitor. So as far as I was concerned, we were just surfers. From 66, it was really the start of the whole way of life. Gwyn caught that revolutionary wave and never looked back. She went on to become our first female surf champion. Having an older brother who's four years older than me, he was a very good surfer, so whatever my brother did, I wanted to do as well. Fifty years on, Gwyn still surfs most days. I just like to get out in the water as much as I could. And I'm one of these people, if the surf looks good, get in there. And it's just freedom, really, from everywhere else. Just outside London, Chris and Linda had been dating almost every night for six whole weeks. We usually went to the cinema locally, didn't we? Yeah. But on Valentine's Day, we went into London to see The Sound of Music, didn't we? We did. We had a lovely evening and we came home on the train and we, we went back to your house, didn't we? And I think you said... I, th I was certainly getting ready to propose, but... You said to me will you? And I said, marry you? Yes! <laughs> Linda got it out first. It was the 14th of February after That's all. Right. That's right, it was 1966. <laughs> For all the talk of 66 swinging, most of Britain was still pretty uptight about sex. If you didn't have a ring on your finger, then you shouldn't be sharing a bed. Michael Palin was 22 and heading to London to find work. At the start of 1966, my girlfriend, who I'd met in 1959, she and I decided we wanted to get married. It was just the only way we could really live together at that time. It's like disapproval if you were, you know, sort of unmarried and living together. So the big thing at the beginning of 66 was to get married and to find enough work to pay for our life together. Michael wasn't alone. 96% of couples who got married in 1966 hadn't lived together before their wedding. 
but attitudes were changing fast. The BBC even produced this documentary about the thorny issue of cohabitation. I think a lot of young people who live together do it for kicks, do it to be smart and, and because it's a kind of in thing to do. Uh, there'll probably be a great big swing of the pendulum uh, when, uh, when this, the, the children of this generation will go back to being frightfully Victorian. Well, that didn't turn out to be true. Sex was here to stay. Everything was talked about in a way it hadn't been about five or six years before. I remember buying my first condom in London. You know, I was terrified. And I went to this shop, just said Durex in enormous letters. I thought, well, that must be OK there. I didn't just want to go into a chemist. I said, tell me your <laughs> condom, please. Excuse me, this is a bookshop. I mean, I managed to lose my virginity about, I think it was about 15. It took a lot of doing. I had asked someone before, and they weren't very keen because I was so young. And I was really curious. But that was it. It was like job done. Not everyone was so keen to dispatch their virginity. In Skegness, Terry Channon was 21 and starting the holiday season as a redcoat at Butlins. It was still a popular family destination, but by 1966, the camps had acquired a bit of a reputation. I got the contract to go to Butlins, and Mum and Dad were not really happy about it. And one of my really good friends, her mum, said to my mum, you shouldn't let her go to Butlins, it's only tarts and slappers who go to Butlins, and she'll come back pregnant. My mum was mortified and it really, really hurt her and upset her. Um, so I, I think with that, it, that was probably in my mind that I wasn't ever going to let that happen. Um, I was never going to let my mum and dad down. My cousin had a baby out of wedlock and that was absolutely frowned on. I always remember walking down the aisle with a rather large bouquet of flowers in front of a, an off-white dress covering the bump. Dave Manville was 17 and living at home in Sheffield. I know people that did get the girlfriends pregnant and some of them either kept the child or they were adopted. Having been in that position myself, I remember going home and saying to my mum and dad, I've got a girlfriend pregnant, and my dad said to me, what are you going to do? So I just said, oh, I'm going to marry her. And he just carried on. That was it. The pill had become available in 1961, so you might think that everyone was over it by 1966, that the fear of pregnancy had faded into the past, but the truth is rather different. By 1966, there were still fewer than half a million women actually on the pill. It was expensive, hard to get hold of, and for some, morally questionable. The doctor would turn around and ask you, had you not got any morals? And it, it, they would try to convince you that you were morally wrong. You wanted contraceptive aid. You couldn't go to a doctor for advice. You're not quite convinced you wouldn't get it. GPs were instructed to only prescribe the pill to married women, with the written permission of their husbands, of course. Why couldn't I have sex with whoever I wanted? Why should someone else decide? I still get angry about it. With no access to the pill and still doing her A-levels, Janet discovered she was pregnant. Abortion was illegal, but backstreet practitioners were commonplace. I realised I was pregnant and there was no pill or anything then. And someone told me about somewhere I could go in Camden Town or Kentish Town and the woman would do it for 25 quid. I waited till a weekend when my parents had gone away and I phoned this woman up and I went up there. I don't really want to go into details, but it wasn't very pleasant. And um, I came back to Perryvale and I lost a lot of blood, but I was fine and then just went back to school and wondered. Actually, I can't tell you it affected me mentally. I was just a huge sense of relief. I mean, obviously now you think, oh, my 
God, you're letting this woman, you know, do stuff to you with washing up liquid or whatever it was. Uh, God knows what it was. But I had tried before to take pills. You used to go to these chemists around Leicester Square and ask for this, that and the other, but they didn't work. An estimated 100,000 illegal abortions were carried out every year during the 60s. A bill to legalise failed in 1966, but was finally passed the following year. It didn't change the country overnight, but gradually women began to have more control over their bodies and their lives. Back in Barking, anticipation was building for the big event. No, not that one. Chris and Linda's wedding. We got married on June the 16th. On the 11th. June the 11th, yes, June the 11th. And then we went to Stratford-on-Avon for our honeymoon. Yes. Mm. We stayed in a hotel. But somebody had bought a book with him. Had I? Yes. <laughs> he always did things right, and he still does. And he always did things by the book. And we sat in bed with a book telling us exactly how to do it. <laughs> I do not remember this. Oh, I do yes, not remember this. You used to be able to go into the chemist and there'd be a stand of books on hemorrhoids and diabetes and having a baby. And one of them was on sex. Sex manuals were a thriving market in 1966 and a happy marriage promoted as the cornerstone of respectable adult life. Over on the Wirral, 19-year-old Pete Price realised that his own feelings about sex were not being explained in a pamphlet. When I started to feel the way I felt, I, I didn't know what I was feeling. You know, it wasn't talked about. It was still a criminal activity. It was illegal to be gay. In 1966, being gay could feel like a life sentence, and that wasn't far off the truth. If caught or even suspected of homosexuality, you faced a prison term. I lived a lie. I lived a lie. I went out with girls. I dabbled with a couple of pals who were experimenting with sex. But it was a lie. The whole thing was a lie because I was frightened. When you got married, were you consciously aware of the fact that you were marrying somebody with homosexual tendencies? No. I was marrying somebody I loved, and that was it. This woman married a homosexual. Twice during their marriage, he was arrested for importuning. The second time, he killed himself, rather than face the punishment of a court and the disgust of his friends. Still living at home with his mum, Pete had to be careful to hide his secret. I came home one Thursday night, two o'clock in the morning, and my mother was lying in bed, and not, normally she wasn't awake, and she had a letter in her hand which had fallen out my bureau, which was referring to other guys. And my mother said, what's this? And she was white as a sheet, and I was white as a sheet, and I thought, it's got to be done. And I said, I'm a homosexual, uh, to which she was physically sick, absolutely distraught. She cried herself to sleep for three years. There wasn't so much a gay scene in Liverpool as a gay pub. The magic clock offered Pete a rare opportunity to let his guard down, once he made it inside, that is. So this was the area where it was all happening, and the magic clock was about here. It was a small pub, but we had to be careful when we went there because of the theatre, because all the people coming out of the theatre, if they saw you, what were you doing? Going into a gay bar? You couldn't go into a gay bar. And it was really weird. So we would wait outside and then somebody say, now, come on in. Gay life was so well hidden in 66, most people didn't know it existed. What was gay? No idea, we didn't come part of the game. You know, the biggest stars in the world may have been gay, but we didn't know, we didn't really care. Not, not the era I'm talking about, not 66. Maybe in sophisticated London, maybe, but not in Sheffield. Like Liverpool, Sheffield was a city of macho men and heavy industry. 
Sheffield was a tough city, steel and tough, tough people. Uh, a peculiar mix of everything because it was still the old Sheffield, the steelworks were still there. You know, you were factory fodder. When you failed your 11 plus, that was it. Nobody wanted to know. The Beatles may have made working class accents cool, but the majority of work available in Sheffield was still hard manual labour. Peter Stringfellow had found his strengths lay elsewhere and got a job as a door-to-door -door salesman toting carpets to housewives. I could talk. <laughs> that changed too much. I could talk, which transferred into being a salesman. I didn't know what a salesman was. I just would talk to people about what I was trying to sell them, and somehow it worked. Um, but that also got me into trouble. And I actually um, transferred some stock from the company I was working for into my car, which became mine. And I mixed it up, their stock with my property. In other words, I was stealing their carpets. And I started selling those for cash, <laughs> knocking on doors and selling them. And I went, wait, this is a lot of money. Then someone reported these carpets going missing. And I went to court. And the magistrate decided I needed teaching a lesson. I was 20 years old, just married. My wife was about I was pregnant. And he really sussed me. So he sent me to prison for three months. I thought that was the end of my life. That was me finished. You couldn't come out of prison in those days and get a job. You were finished. There was no, like, give this boy a chance, you know? No. They liked me. I had about three or four inches. I had it liked me, but no way was it going to give me a job. Michael had left Sheffield for Cambridge University a few years earlier, but was still very involved with the fortunes of the local football teams. Sheffield Wednesday were in the cup final. This meant more to me than the World Cup in any shape or form. We were coasting home and suddenly Everton, we were playing, scored two late goals. Absolute disaster. I felt absolutely mortified. And I'm a Sheffield United supporter. And this was Sheffield Wednesday, but it was just because I was from Sheffield. I wanted so much, wanted them to, to, uh, to win in World Cup, yeah. The FA Cup had wet our appetites. Television sets were flying off the shelves as we got ready for the World Cup. For the first time, the matches would be broadcast live, and by the summer, nine in every ten homes owned a TV. The growing popularity of television provided Michael with his very first job, presenting a new youth show, appropriately called Now. The ordinary pop show, Ready, Steady, Go and Top of the Pops, had sort of led the way, but there was something more now. So I was there really to do little comedy links, and I happened to be able to do the Harold Wilson accent. Hello, good evening, is your Prime Minister here? And the rest of it was doing all sorts of strange things. I remember acting with a wonderful actor called Arthur Mullard. We did a piece where I'm playing dun 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 and end up smashing the piano in the middle of a field. So whatever the guys wrote, I would have to do these, these little sort of links. Anarchic television was proving popular, and it wasn't long before a new opportunity came along for Michael. Quite out of the blue, the BBC rang up and said, we've got this new series called The Frost Report. It's going to have a theme to it each week. Um, David Frost is going to present it. There are going to be sketches. We've got a, a cast of ten new performers. Ronnie Barker, Ronnie Corbett, and a man called John Cleese, you might have heard of. I said, oh, yes, I've heard of him from Cambridge. Does it hurt you if I do this? <laughs> Well, it hurts. And we would like you to submit material. A new kind of comedy was being born. The Frost Report brought together all the British Monty Pythons for the very first time. The first thing we got sold to them, the two Ronnies did it, was just a policeman coming in and saying... Good morning, Super. Morning, wonderful. <laughs> it was a very silly thing. <laughs> the embers were burning. Television was changing as quickly as we were. In 1966, the BBC even announced the move to colour broadcasting. But this radical innovation didn't apply to the colour of the people appearing on it. It was completely dominated by white people. 
And when they saw a black face on the television, they used to call everybody and say, come, come, there's a black person on the television. Well, a coloured person on the television. Nina Baden Semper became a huge star in the 70s, appearing in the frankly quite racist sitcom Love Thy Neighbour. Perhaps you want to call next door and introduce ourselves to our new neighbours. Oh, come on, let's get settled in first, huh? Well, you know, I can't help feeling that we are going to come as a surprise to them. <laughs> if you ask me, I'd say it'd be more of a shock. <laughs> But back in 1966, she had arrived from Trinidad and was struggling to find work. There weren't many parts written for women, for a start. Therefore, there weren't many parts written for black women. So it was, you had to take whatever there was in those days, you know. You didn't have a choice, really. There weren't very many black people around. So it was difficult for them to identify with us, you know because they treated us with uh, suspicion because of the colour. They didn't know. It was ignorance. In 1966, a new sitcom appeared on our screens that captured that ignorance perfectly. Till death us do part. I mean, the ones I'm talking about, they're your proper blacks, you know, the ones that was born in a jungle, your natives. I mean, don't tell me they're educated. Half of them are still eating each other. <laughs> oh, devil. You talk some ruddy nonsense, a pair of them. Oi, 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 that's enough of that. What? All that swearing, I won't have it. <laughs> What's the matter with these nail things? The programme quickly became the most watched show on television. The irascible Alf Garnett and his bigoted racist tirades drew an incredible 60 million viewers an episode. Though Till Death Us Do Part was intended as satire, it certainly reflected some very real attitudes of 1966. I got a lovely story from my sister, actually, who was a nurse, and she, the surgeon said to her, Oh, Miss Baden Semper, how come you speak such a good English? And she said, Well, the Englishman lived in the tree next to mine. <laughs> yeah. How did you find that, you know, black white thing in those days? No, How did you pack it? Well, I just went with like the flow. Most GIs stayed away from the whites. Mm. Yeah. You know, it's just trouble. It's going to cause trouble and all of that. And you go somewhere where blacks hang out. Mm. As a matter of fact, in England, you have a country of variety, the changes of the season, and it has entered into the people themselves. Yet, the Englishman, or the white man for that matter, doesn't want the variety of the human species. He likes to see white only. The impending World Cup only added to the international feel of Britain in 1966. Alongside the footballers, thousands of migrants were arriving to make a new life here. The Asian population of the UK had quadrupled in the five years leading up to 66. Yasmin Sheikh was 21 and had arrived in Leicester from East Africa to live with her sister and brother. The city now has an abundance of Asian shops, but back then you were lucky to find a bulb of garlic. This is tamarind, bittersweet. You make chutney out of this. Lovely stuff. Lady's finger. Okra, not gentleman's finger, not man's finger. <laughs> Thank God somewhere the women got the preference. <laughs> Yasmin and Parveen had been teachers in East Africa and found work at a local school, changing quickly with the influx of new faces. I used to volunteer to sit with the kids, only to eat the dessert because I loved the English, you know, pudding yeah. and all those things. Dick, okay, I'm spotty Dick. Spotted dick with the custard. Everybody was talking against school meals, but we loved them, yes, didn't it? Yes. Because it was a change for us. The first school I uh, taught was Medway Junior School, mm. and that is myself on this side here. And you can see the diversity at that time because of the influx of the immigrants. Many of the new arrivals didn't speak any English at all, so for a while, daily life was mystifying. Uh, one of our friends who was a doctor, and he was having problems because the health visitors 
uh, were not allowed in the home of the women who had just delivered a baby uh, because they were suspicious why this woman is coming. They had no idea that that's part of the system here. So he then remembered that these two sisters can speak their language and we suggested that because we can't expect these women who had never been to school in their life to learn English straight away but we thought if the health visitors can pick up a few greeting words and build the bridge so I had to teach Urdu in 1966 to the health visitors like Assalamu Alaikum Aap kaisi hai? you know very friendly words and then they they went to these homes and they would come and greet them and the women were oh Urdu that you can speak Urdu oh come 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 and they would let them come in and then the problem was they wouldn't let them go because that's the Asian culture you know until they fed them so much you never got it It wasn't only new arrivals who had stigma to overcome. In Sheffield, Peter had served his time and needed to earn money. The booming youth scene provided the perfect opportunity. Alongside his brother Jeff, he decided to open a music venue. There was another club. I had great times. And he helped me when he could. Peace string fella. The Mojo Club. 65 and 66, I was having an absolute ball. I was having a great time in my King Mojo Club. I got an ear for music. I heard something, I liked it. I booked them. In 66, Dave and Paul were working for the electricity board and the department store CNA. But they were at the club every night it was open. Paul even got a job painting psychedelic murals on the wall. 66, it was a whole. Well, for me, Tuesdays, Thursdays was records, Friday, Saturdays, Sunday could be live music, live band. We got all the top London acts that we would never have seen in Sheffield. So we got everybody, Rod Stewart, Elton John. The Kings, Pink Floyd, and on and on it goes. The Who was so loud, I think you could have heard them in Peterborough. What do you reckon was one of your favourite nights then? The Mojo. One of the, I remember, is the Small Faces. Mm. And I turned to another one, the Benny King, you know why? Because he invited me. So sang. More and more. sang. I sang with him, yeah. <laughs> I sang with Benny King and I can't sing. <laughs> it gives you a little idea how big that stage was, you remember? Well, couldn't figure out how little Stevie Wonder and, and his orchestra. And his orchestra. And, I, and I, I can Tina Turner and their big band. And how, the Akets. And Yeah, how they all fit on. When the groups weren't playing, you had to fill in time. I had a piccadilly sandwich eating competition. I'd have dancing competition, anything to keep them focused. Because if you didn't, a fight would start. A fight would start, bang, bullet crash, and it would only stop when your group came on. The King Mojo didn't look like any club you'd see today. A suburban house on a residential street but it became the beating heart of the music scene in Sheffield, and Peter was the king. We'd invented all-nighters, which came from London, a club called the Flamingo, which had all-nighters with all the blues boys. And we were booking the, some of the biggest soul names in the world for four o'clock in the morning, because there was nobody else to book them. Of course, for the few years I was there, the, the neighbors were going mad. They thought they was the almighties. That's how the string fellas worked. They just wanted to push everyone around. They didn't, they didn't think about the children or, or, or the old people or anyone else or the residents. The police soon had Peter in their sights again. He was back in court, this time to try and save his club. Everyone outside gets an idea that it's nothing but a dirty cellar. And in fact, it's, it's, it's just a wonderland for young people. They've got to come inside to assess this. Even the magistrates never came in. Nobody's interested, that's all right, we must. They just want to get rid of the mojo and that's it. The story goes that the guy was breeding budgies next door to the yard as you come into the mojo club. And when we went to court and I was asking for a license and they were opposing, and he went up in front of the magistrates and he actually said to this guy, look, I've been breeding budgies all my life. Since that mojo's had the all-nighters, all those eggs are cracked. We've never had a new budgie. And the magistrate went, oh, it's terrible. 
<laughs> they, they, they turned the licence down. I blamed the budgets. The authorities may have been clamping down, but the genie was out of the bottle. The morals and attitudes of the older generation were fast becoming a thing of the past. After six months of marriage, my husband became allergic to... To, to latex. So I could no longer use condoms. We had to start using the pill. And my mum said, it's no good going to see your doctor here because she's Catholic and she won't prescribe the pill. So you went to your doctor, didn't you? Mm -hmm. And he said, tell Linda to come to me and I'll prescribe it to her, although I wasn't on his list. And so I didn't get pregnant. <laughs> Chris and Linda weren't the only ones looking for medical advice. In Liverpool, Pete and his mum had booked an appointment with their GP. Well, we went to the doctor because it was seen as a medical problem. The doctor informed my mother that I could be cured of being a homosexual. There was a treatment. If I went to a mental institute in Chester, they put me into this place with a false name, which I had to have a false name, because I was a criminal. And then the big day came uh, when I had to uh, have my treatment. And what they did was they recorded me um, talking about sex for an hour on a Grundy TK20, the old tape recorders, always remember that. And they would ask me everything about sex, but using the graphic description. They then put me in a room with no windows, with a male nurse, and I was in a bed, and I had magazines, dirty magazines. And then they asked me what I drank. I drank Guinness in those days, so there was cases of Guinness. So I listened to the tape, drink the Guinness, and look at the books. And halfway through the hour, they injected me, which made me vomit, and also made me go to the toilet. I, uh, sat in my own excrement and my own vomit and that lasted an hour and then it did it again and again and again and for 72 hours there wasn't much left of me at the end of it i wasn't being cured of being gay all i was was lying there thinking i am never going to be seen again alive because nobody knows i'm in here because i'm under a false name i will never ever get out of here and I was really, really frightened. That's all I was thinking of. So I said, I want out. And from that day onwards, I said, enough is enough. I've got to try and accept who and what I am. Mod, rocker, moon maiden or dandy, your clothes told the world who you were in 1966. Fashion had exploded into a sea of colour and combustible nylon. I can't believe I walked down the street in Liverpool in a pair of blue leather hot pants with Mickey Mouse braces and a leather cloak. And I didn't think I was gay. I thought I was getting away with it. I really shake my head in disbelief at what I got away with. Pete wasn't the only one stretching his sartorial wings. Let's be honest, we were all dressing like lunatics. Well, apart from Chris, maybe. You had a knitted tie. I had a knitted tie, yes. I can still see the knitted tie. <laughs> it was the same width all the way down, <laughs> with a square Bottom. end. Well, I was probably just on the transition from corduroy to jeans, you know? I looked fantastic in 1966. I used to wear all the modern clothes, and my favourite shop was Bieber. Well, here's a little Bieber dress. Very nice, very simple. So revolutionised the whole thing. Very clever lady. I loved Bieber. They always produced nice swimsuits, I think, in the 60s. They were quite fashionable, weren't they? And the bathing hats, they were very flowery. Lots of hair, lots of eyelashes. The traditional, iconic Twiggy look. Very short skirts, but my legs were better then. They have bikinis, but not me, because I, I've always been quite buxom, as I would say. And if I dived under a wave, the bikini wouldn't be there at the top anymore. So um, I, I never liked bikinis. It would be off. 
<laughs> Here's another one with a short skirt. And we always had to wear boots with it, which was the fashion in those days. We just thought we could do anything. We were so cocky, it was unbelievable. And I just thought, well, I might have funny teeth and glasses, but, you know, I look great. But we did look and dress outlandish. And if you really wanted to look unique, or you had to break out the needle and thread. From the age of 14, I'd always made loads of my own clothes, and I didn't want to look like anybody else. I made myself a silver leather coat, and it just looked fabulous. Janet's silver jacket was soon to land her a part in a legendary film of 66. Set in swinging London, Blow Up follows a young mod photographer in a world of fashion, pop music and easy sex. The Italian film director Antonioni was looking for extras at Janet's university. He needed to shoot in a nightclub and he was using Jeff Beck and the Yardbirds to play in the nightclub, so he needed a lot of London trendies. Antonioni picked me out and I got to dance with this black guy and we got extra money and I remember the others got the hump because I got action money. <laughs> the others had to stand around and I was like, <laughs> dancing. 66 may have been swinging for London singles, but in Leicester, Yasmin realised that her sister's arranged marriage was in trouble. When I came here, it was like a grey cloud everywhere, and I thought, what's happened to her, you know? I mean, this is not normal. It was great to have her. If she wasn't there... We wouldn't be here today. <laughs> Yasmin arrived to discover that her Indian brother-in-law was living with another woman and had been for years. My husband wasn't with me, he was with an English woman. I didn't know. When I came, I found out. He never stayed with me. And, in fact, I went to see him. She saw him. She said, he's not good for you. Just forget him and leave him. In 1966, Parveen did something unheard of in the Asian community she filed for a divorce. Muslim women, it was unheard. But what my husband, ex-husband thought, she will not do anything, so I'll have English and Asian. That's what he had in mind. But I said, no way. I'd rather be alone than have as a second wife. And I took the very difficult decision, but I did. I think we set the precedent after that, didn't we? <laughs> A lot of Muslim girls started coming out of the deadlock, you know. They realized that you can do it, you know. You can't just suffer while the man is having a, another woman on the side. It wasn't just women who were asserting their rights. In Belfast, sectarian prejudice meant that Catholics were being treated as second-class citizens. Jobs were being advertised Protestant only and many Catholic families were living in slum conditions. But young Catholics in Northern Ireland were growing in confidence too. Queen's University student Emma McCann picked up a loud hailer and started campaigning for change. It was perhaps naive and romantic to believe that we were about to transcend and to sweep over the old sectarian divides because we were young, cool, international people. As, uh, sadly, it wasn't to be, but it was a very attractive idea at the time, for me anyway. Inspired by the civil rights demonstrations in America, the students saw that peaceful protests could have a huge impact. There was a tendency tendency always sort of within the Catholic community, I mean, to see ourselves as the equivalent of black people in the United States. The Martin Luther King speech would have been listened to and read and celebrated as much, I think, by young people in Northern Ireland as by anybody outside the Afro-American people themselves. The emerging civil rights movement offered many people hope that change was on the way. A huge housing estate was even being built on the Falls Road to provide better housing for the Catholics there. 
Tommy Fisher was eight years old and living nearby when he saw the Divis Flats going up. People were sold on the idea it was going to be wonderful, they were going to have central heating, they were going to have baths. A bath? You know, I don't remember anyone having a bathroom. You had a tin bath that was put in front of the fire. Tough luck of you, the last one. <laughs> <laughs> In 1966, the threat of violence in Northern Ireland felt very far away. In fact, the province had the lowest crime rate in the whole of the UK. The peace didn't last long. In the May of 66, a loyalist paramilitary group called the UVF reformed amid rumours of a resurgence of IRA activity. By June, they had killed two Catholic civilians, John Scullion and Peter Ward. For Eamon McCann, the killing seemed like the last gasp of the old sectarian ways. But others saw what was to come. My Aunt Sissy said to me, when we were marching for civil rights, very, very early days, she said, son, if you keep this up, we'll be burned out of our house. Uh, it says, we'll be burned out of our house if you people keep, uh, keep up this marching in the streets and causing trouble. Yeah, uh, I don't... She was right. She was burned out of her house just a couple of years later. The Divis Flats became an iconic image, not of progress, but of the troubles in Northern Ireland. Those shots fired in 66 would echo for another 30 years. America was influencing Britain in other ways too. In London, Gino was finding that his new career as a soul singer was perfectly timed. Black American artists were now leading a charge on the charts. Gino Washington and the Ram Jam Band. Gino and his Ram Jam band had become the hottest live act in time. Gino, they became the biggest act ever to draw a crowd at the Mojo Club. We could play him once a month, no problem. It cannot be denied. We was the best house rocker. Gino, Gino, Gino. Gino's reputation as an electrifying live performer meant that the Ram Jam Band were playing high up on the festival bills that summer. I just got me some new clothes out of Cornaby Cabin, off Cornaby Street here. I'm going to the festival, I'm looking sharp, I'm feeling sharp. When we get there, the crowd dragged me out of the van and put me on their shoulders, right? Now, my trousers are all split. My butt is hanging out and everything, you know what I mean? They're carrying me through the audience. About 100 yards there. And you got the small faces. They're playing, right? Steve Merritt's doing his thing and everything. And so when they put me up on the stage, he says, all right, you want the nigga? You can have it. <laughs> It, it, it didn't bother me, you know what I mean? I was worried more about my trousers. <laughs> yeah, Gino Washington. Do you know how the flags are flying in Birmingham here today? Yes. Why is it? Oh, I know the word cop. Can you remember the excitement building because oh we've got through that we've got through that and sort of all of a sudden we're in the final aren't we and you think oh wow oh we've got to stand a chance who do you think is going to win england i hope no a well in cup win a german world cup fever had broken into a sweat england had got into the final and the whole world was waiting to see whether Alf's boys could beat their arch enemy West Germany. I got out of going to a wedding to watch the World Cup final. Everybody was sort of full of World Cup football fever. I wasn't even remotely interested in the World Cup. In the Midlands, Sandy counted down the days 
waiting for the team to walk onto the pitch wearing the puma boots she had helped to make. But the beautiful game was about to turn ugly. Rival brand Adidas had offered the England players a thousand pounds to wear their boots instead. Jack Charlton was so annoyed at the dealings that he threatened to wear one Puma boot and one Adidas. The day of the World Cup final arrived. 32 million Brits gathered around television sets to watch the game. For the eagle-eyed, it looked like a clean sweep for Adidas. But not quite. One key player was wearing Puma boots. I think the only person that actually wore those boots was Gordon Banks, which was a goalkeeper. I know he definitely had Puma boots because I was quite a fan of Gordon Banks. <laughs> I thought he was quite cute, the goalkeeper. <laughs> Even if you weren't rooting for England, for those 120 minutes, the eyes of the world were on Britain in a year when more than just a football match hung in the balance. It's equaliser! First time I went to London, I got to Euston Station, I took my coat off, put it on my shoulders, got my cigarette holder out, and I minced down the platform, and I was home. We were taking control of our destiny. I went home and my mother was shoving washing in the machine and I just looked at her and I went, well, that's it, I'm off. And I just got a bag of stuff and walked out and I never went back home after that. 66 put us on the path to the lives we live today. The referee consulted the right and goal it was. A live album. Cool. It's old. It's old, did it? What? It's old? <laughs> It kept bouncing from number two to five for 42 weeks. We were making choices that would shape our entire lives. Jeff Hurst saw an opening in the defence and achieved the hat-trick. For Terry and her boyfriend Dave, that day would stay with them forever. Dave walked me back to my little tiny pokey chalet and he proposed to me that night and I think it was because we were just on a bit of a high, really. That was my sort of recollection of the World Cup, was me getting engaged, really. That was far more important to me than the World Cup. It was, it was lovely. You know what? <laughs> they may have thought it was all over. <laughs> but actually... Oh, yeah. It had only just begun. 1966 changed our lives completely. We're where we are today because of 1966, aren't we? And you won the World Cup. And West Ham won the World Cup.